Hey, and good morning, everyone. If you have the book of, uh, or the letter that Paul wrote to the Colossian church, we got to continue this, this uh, series that we somewhat began last Sunday. Uh, well, we use that word necessary uh, throughout this because Paul speaks with this kind of fervor uh, about necessary things, right? This morning, I want to talk about necessary knowledge or necessary insight. You know, there are insights you can have or knowledge you can have that is good. There's a lot of things that are good to know, right? It's just good to know. If, if you're alone uh, in a desert, uh, deserted road someplace and, and your phone is out of battery and your tires is flat, it's kind of good to know how you put a spare on. Good to know. It's not necessary, but it's good to know, right? Uh, and, and so there are a lot of things, you know, there are things that are absolutely useless to know. We still know a lot of that, right? And I, I don't even have to give you an example of that. There are things that are just interesting to know, uh, uh, and it's just interesting, you know, but knowing about whatever goes on in this little place in, in uh, the year 1500, you know, something, you know, that's interesting. There are things that are important to know, but there are things that are necessary to know. And, and Paul talks about this this morning. And just for the sake of time, I could give so many illustrations on that, right? On the difference between the botanists that can, that can distinguish between hundreds and hundreds of flowers and those of us who can just say, well, that's red and that's yellow, right? And, and, and you know, the distinction between a, a researcher, a medicinal researcher who has, you know, through thousands of tests have come to realize how cells and bacteria work and how that all goes. And then those of us who feel like, well, I got run a fever, I'm probably safe. There's knowledge and there's knowledge. And, and so I want you to kind of get to this where we see the importance of some of these things, right? Uh, and the importance of knowing what is truly valuable. I could have given you an example about literature also. There's some people who can read and they can discern between what is truly meaningful and significant and, and that which is just kind of trivial and, and that which is, is uh, lasting and important and that which is just momentary and so on. Paul talks to us about a knowledge that is about as necessary as you can. So if you have your scripture by now, it is Colossians chapter 1. We continue uh, in the verse 9. And here's one of the most incredible texts that we have. If you didn't have a chance to be here last Sunday or to listen to, to, um, to that message, I encourage you to go back to you see the whole uh, kind of context for, for some of this. But, but look here, amazing text. Paul says, for this reason also, since the day we have heard this, we have not stopped praying for you. We are asking that you will be filled with the knowledge, or in some of your translation, it'll say filled with insight. That, that word is kind of hard to translate there. Uh, of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that, in order that, for the purpose that, you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patiently and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In him we have the redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. You know, this is one of these texts that you can stay with, and I probably should have unpacked that over a whole month or two months maybe even. There's so much power in this. But the prayer that we find right here is about as timeless and as significant as any prayer you could ever find or pray yourself. We have not stopped praying for you that you will be filled with insight or knowledge about the will of God. And if insight and knowledge is important in any area, it certainly is important here. This 
knowing the will of God is, is not just important for, you know, getting God's work done. It will reveal to you who you are. Why you, have you ever struggled with identity questions or, or purpose questions and that kind of, this here will bring that out in the most powerful, powerful way. The Greek word actually that is used here uh, for, for knowledge or insight really means that you pull things together. So you pull, you know, various kinds of facts, the various kinds of information, the various kinds of impressions, and, and all that you've kind of known and looked at and studied and all, you pull that together that you will be able to draw certain conclusions because you know certain things and to reach certain kind of uh, ways of looking at things, even seeing connections you may not have seen otherwise. And as that is applied, that word that Paul uses is applied to the insight here in God's will. It simply means that the way to get that is that you pull together all the facts that you know about God, that you pull together the information that you have noticed as you have paid attention to how he works in your life and around you and all these things. And as you study and you pull it all together so that from that, you will be able to draw conclusions about your own life, though so that's what he speaks to me. Just think about this. These conclusions, if you will, will be drawn or made also when you talk about decisions here, right? Uh, they will be made in all wisdom and spiritual understanding not flippantly not coincidentally but he asked that they would have that insight that they may be able to do just that and what that means is that there's something personal going on here right you can have knowledge about things you study them externally you know what i'm talking about right i can even do that with my wife i can tell you how tall she is i can tell you what hair color she has I can tell you what she weighs. I can tell you what she's about and what she's doing and all that. But for me to actually know her, that's what we call personal knowledge. I have to open myself to her so that I might be changed in that process. Are you hearing me? That's how personal knowledge works. That's not necessarily if I'm studying a cube someplace or a computer or how that works or whatever, but that is necessary for personal knowledge. That's why also it makes no sense in Scripture, none, that to consider God's will in any kind of theoretical way. It just gives no meaning to think about that as something external, something you, you will not act on. Paul cannot even imagine, but people say, I'm seeking God's will, but not to do anything with it. You, that you may have insight into God's will by studying his written word, scripture, deeply and consistently and again and again and walking with his living word, Jesus Christ, on a consistent basis also that you will be, by the power of the Spirit, able to discern, to pull all this together. What is God's will for my life? and for our life together. So if you don't mind us kind of opening up uh, this incredible, incredible text and just look at it, how it speaks to the very center of the Christian life. You know, Paul, as I mentioned last time, is, is coming up against these false teachers. And you want to tell this whole letters about this, these teachers who are taking some of the truths from the Christian faith, and then they're taking all the truths from the culture around them and all these other things and what's going on and what people believe about this system and that system and this system, and they're pulling it together, and then they're kind of creating their own Christianity. And Paul says there's no such thing. The only way to know God and his will is to study his word and walk with his son in the power of his spirit. That's the way, and so it is one of these kind of things 
when you get to this, you're at the very centerpiece of what it means to be a Christian. And so, you know, when you think about uh, some of this, how do we train our kids? We just talked about, we just talked about VBS. I can't help but to think about it also. When I was dealing with my kids, um, and of course now with my grandkids, small as they are still, you know, David's old word is one that you steal every parent. This is the word, that the prayer that you should be praying. Just think of this to you. This is what, what David prays for Solomon, his son. He says, now my son, this is in First Chronicles 10, uh, 22. Now my son, may the Lord be with you and may your success in building the Lord's house, uh, b- building the house of the Lord your God. And above all, May the Lord give you insight and understanding when he puts you in charge of Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. In other words, so that you may live rightly before God. And then a little bit later, we see Solomon actually pray. And what does he say? He said, Lord, give me insight that I may walk rightly before you and just imagine this as I was praying through this what if everyone here hundreds and hundreds as we are and every one of you all watching from someplace if we say this will be our foremost prayer concern again and again and again and every day that we, my kids, my friends, my spouse, my parents, my grandparents, my friends at work, my classmates, that we, or that they, you don't want to pray for yourself, then that they at least, that they will come to know and have greater insight. Praying that prayer that David prayed, give me wisdom and insight that I may be able to walk rightly, live a life that fills me with the kind of joy and blessing that can only come from God. And so as we park, walk through this text, you'll see that uh, the power of this right here, the first thing he talks about, just go to verse 10, right? So he's given these explanations here. For this reason, we have not stopped praying for you day and night that you may be filled with this insight so that you can walk or that you can live. That so that is a strong purpose statement in, in, in the Greek, and I'm not going to tie you with, with kind of grammar like that, but just to say it means for the purpose of, in order that. So there's a reason for why he's asking that they may know the will of God. That they can walk with him fully pleasing to him, worthy of him. You know, the distinction between insight in general and insight into God's will is that normal kind of general insight is always theoretical, at least it can be, where that is never, as I mentioned before, possible with insight into God's will. It is not something, Paul writes here, of course, to the whole church, right? It's not something for a specific kind of people, the specially chosen elite Christians or whatever you want to call it, to know the will of God. It is for all of us. He's writing to the whole church. And I want to say again in a stronger way, if you think this is just terrifically important, kind of a side issue kind of in the Christian walk. You are, you are, you're, you're misunderstood. You need to rethink. What does it mean to even use the word Christian? Call yourself Christian. That means that you have decided that you will follow Jesus Christ. That is, your whole aim is to live 
in accordance with his will, pleasing to him. That's what that title entails. That's what that means. We're at the very center here that we may be filled with insights so that we can live in the way that pleases the one whose name we have taken. And notice also here, I want to make sure that we see this. This is not like it's just a spiritual kind of a thing. This touches all of life. You can't separate the spiritual from the regular part of life, but that's also not what Paul is talking about. He wants us to see the visual impact all aspects. That we live in such a way, if you live according to the will of God, that people, when they listen to you, and hear you speak when they look at you and see your actions when they recognize how you react or even act, they have to have seen some kind of a glimpse of who Jesus is. Of course, not in full because we can't do that, but they have seen, oh, that's different. There's something there. Why are they acting like this? The word is strong here, and again, I I have to deal with it because it is so incredibly important. This whole thing that you are living in a way fully pleasing, that word, Paul picked up that word of all the words he could have used. That word is used sometimes negatively because when you use it toward other people, it becomes a negative word. It means that you give up your own rights. It means that you are no longer looking at yourself. You're you're just kind of behaving. At any wink that this other person is doing, you're kind of following for one purpose, that is to gain their favor. That's the meaning of that word. And if that's toward another person, mm, you know, think again. Well, but when it's toward God, it's a different thing. He will never take advantage of that. His purpose is that you will be more what? Fruitful. Look at the text, Right? and joyful that your life will come to bear fruit and be filled with joy. That is the result of having this full desire. And we know that that is important, right? We know how that works in so many ways. It's not easy. It's just not easy to grow we like to talk about growth. We, we agree that growth is important. But as, as a human being, I need to grow in who I am. You know, we, as a Christian, I need to grow in my faith. And we try to define what all that means. But it's kind of hard. Yeah? Are you here? Yeah? It's kind of hard, right? Yeah? Two of you think so. Maybe not even. <laughs> it is kind of hard. You know, and the reason is it, it, we don't always realize that growth comes in first one area and, and then another area and then another area. And in each of these areas come like step by step by step by step. And it is, means simply that there are certain things that we used to do that we no longer do because we've grown in this area and we know better now. Filled with insight that we may or in order that we may please God. Now, when I apply that to kids, it's, it's pretty obvious. You all put up with this, right? So we're proud of them, actually, when they're younger, and they, we say, what is two plus three? Mm, four, no, six, no, oh, it's five. You up it a bit. What is eight plus six? Well, nine, ten, nine. Oh, 14, yay! But if you go to your money people, right? If you go to some accountant and they treat numbers like that, you may not be back. <laughs> we just anticipate that they have grown in that area, right? I, I can give you all kinds of examples of these kinds of things, right? When you grow in certain areas, you get to the point where you just don't even almost think about it anymore. Think about it if you've been sick. Some of you have tried to be sick for a while, more than just a day or two. You were in bed for a while. And when you get up, this first couple of times, you just make sure the first couple of steps that you step right. Yes? 
Well, when I walk here, I don't ever think about whether I step right or not, right? This is what would you do when you're learning a new language. Step by step, step by step. What happens when you learn a new language? Well, at first, you kind of look up a lot of words. And then you mess up with grammar. I still look up, mess up with grammar, right? You hear that. And, and, and you know, but then after a while, you become fluently and you don't think about it. Right? The first time you begin to think about your sentences, is that right? And all that, it, you know. And that's how it is with Christian growth the same way. In the beginning, you know, you see, oh, wow, this is hard, and I'm learning this, and I'm figuring out that this is it, and this is it. And then after a while, it becomes second nature. It becomes who you are, and it, you have accomplished that. Then when you see, oh, I just moved, I can't believe I responded that way. Oh, I can't believe I said this. And then you have to go back and you say, oh, I need to go back and realize this is step by step. There's still something I need to correct and change here that I might grow to live in a way pleasing to the Lord. But let me just move on uh, here and, and let you see the power of this text. So that you may be able to walk and then what's the next? Verse 11. So that you'll be strengthened with all kinds of strength. I don't know that you can kind of pack more content into a biblical verse than what Paul has done here when he's trying to talk to them about the power of God entering their lives. You know, he's kind of like he's trying to pile it on. He's talking about it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's the same power that placed Christ at the right hand side of the Father in heaven. It is the same kind of power that belongs to God alone that He called forth the whole world. That's the kind of power He wants to build in to your life, an enabling power, an uplifting power, an encouraging power, an energizing kind of power. In fact, scholars are scrambling to try to translate what Paul is saying here. The literal translation uh, would be something like he's empowering you with the empowerment of God's power. It's like so bundled up that you've got to find some other ways of saying it in English, and they just said, with all power. You know why is this important? It's important because it points to the fact that we are not supposed to be able to live the Christian life in our own power. That's the point. You know, we can't love the way we're supposed to love in our own power. We can't forgive the way we're supposed to forgive in our own power. We, we can't have care for others the way we're supposed to care for others in our own power. We are not merciful like we're supposed to be merciful in our own power. What Jesus wanted to do is to bring us the kind of power that will make that kind of loving, that kind of forgiving, that kind of care and mercy possible. What goes beyond what we see? I want to strengthen you. This is how Paul says it. I pray day and night for you to have greater insight into God's will. Why? In order that you may be strengthened, or empowered with the empowerment of God's power, strengthened with all power, that these things will happen. You know, I thought about this, and I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you right now, so forgive me for saying it straight, but I'm saying it straight to me. I'm convinced that many times we miss the power of God. Sometimes I meet Christians that have been Christians for 50 years, and you wonder what in the world. And sometimes it comes down to the fact that we have never done anything that required any more power than we could do in our own power. We can do a lot. But that we have been unwilling to step out to these areas and these deep waters, if you will, 
where we needed God, unless God took us and used us and empowered us, we couldn't do it. Most of us like, like to be in the place where the power that we have just as human beings will be sufficient. But when we do, we are missing the point where we are seeing God's power. We dare to live because we've come to the point where we understand his will for us. We dare to live in a place where we daily, truly, genuinely, and not just as a way of saying it, but truly actually need his power. When that happens, and you see that, Paul lands where you can only land. Verse 12. You will start giving thanks to God. Because you know, you know, I, I can't believe this just happened. I should have done this, but I, you know, I did this. God had to have had his hand on me. God had to be the one who carried me when I was about to go under. That's it. And Paul says that will be the result, right? So we're still working with this thing, right? We ask that you'll be filled with the kind of knowledge of the will of God in order that you may be able to live the life he called you, to be strengthened with the power he has and to come to the point where you can't stop but to praise him. Friends, if you can see an empty seat next to you, it would not be there if that's how we live. I'm just telling you. And then as we look at this, the power is extraordinary because he's, he's, not, lit, li, he's not letting up, right? He's, Paul says here that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into a different type kingdom that is the kingdom of his beloved son. In other words, there's a different kind of citizenship. There's a different plan, kind of way of living. There's a different frame of reference for how we think about all things. Paul's uh, illustration here may even in the old Jewish minds to conjure up thoughts about how it was when they lived in the kingdom of darkness, Babylon, exiled from the promised land. And then they were transferred back into the promised land. And Paul is using that to say that is exactly that kind of joyous experience that happens when you leave your own kind of world, and are transferred into God's kind of world, where you know his word, his will for your life. Think about this for a moment, friends. We talked about here uh, so often from the first Sunday I was there uh, and the importance of, of recognizing that God has done great, great things. We're leaving the ashes. We are bringing the embers to the future, and we are blowing on them that they must be fanned into flames. Yes? Because, as the psalmist said, he has put a new song in my heart. And people will see it, they will hear it, and many will come to praise the living God. Friends, I pray that this will not just be me speaking, but that the Spirit will stir in your heart. We prayed as the staff this morning. We pray for this worship service that this will be one of these days where God would walk up and down the aisles in a special way, that he would do a special work in each heart so that we all of us may be longing and yearning for the reality. And it will be our prayer day and night consistently that you may come to have insight, necessary insight into God's will. Father, I ask for this whole church and those who are with us in different ways, would you pour out your spirit upon all of us? I ask that you would do your work as only you can do. 
I ask, Lord, that everyone will forget my feeble words and remember what you have spoken to their heart. That we may be so moved and so eager to get to the point where we hear in new ways what Paul is saying to Christians, not only in Colossae, but throughout all generations. That we may be eager to come to know what it means to live in God's will, to be filled with his strength, and to be overflowing, be overflowing with thanksgiving and joy. Thank you, Lord.